Good morning, and how are you doing today? I hope it's another wonderful day for you. Today, I am going to tell you a story of what, no, the most epic journey that I have ever done. When I decided to drive from my parents' house in Scotland to South Africa. I really don't like flying. And, and I like Land Rovers. Oh, did I mention I was doing it in a Land Rover? Anyway, I bought a Land Rover. A 300 TDI, no, was it 300? Yeah, 300 TDI, two and a half litre, naturally aspirated turbo diesel. And decided I would kit it out and drive from my parents' house in Scotland, because I have to sell my house, <laughs> I'd live somewhere, to South Africa. So I um, kitted out the Land Rover with uh, long range fuel tanks, side awning, roof rack, upgraded suspension, tougher tires, you know, sort of more off road, semi off road tires, um, second auxiliary battery. I basically made a nice Land Rover. Took out all the back seats so I could use it for storage area. Bought a lot of stuff, half of which I never used, but we'll come to that later. And uh, most importantly, bought a nice, comfy, inflatable mattress. My plan was, I did take a tent, but I was just going to sleep on the roof for most of the journey through Africa. And Africa's sunny, warm, safe. I just sleep on the roof. That's what I planned to do. Um, so I bought this Land Rover, not a new Land Rover, it was a nearly new, a second-hand Land Rover, had uh, 12,000 miles on the clock, and uh, at that time Tomb Raider was out, so she got dubbed Lara. So Lara is my Land Rover. And in November, nice time of year, snow on the hills, I set out from Scotland to traverse Africa. <laughs> yep. Anyway, packed all my camera equipment, packed loads of spares, packed a handbook of how to repair a Land Rover. Uh, you know, all the essentials. Oh, and lots of food. Oh, did I mention I also had a fridge that ran off the car battery that was charged off a solar panel on the roof? Anyway. Um, so, yeah. One morning in uh, November, Say goodbye to my mum and dad, wished them well, and drove south. Now the plan was from that point to drive as far south from Scotland as possible until I got to South Africa. Ah, this was going to be a journey. Now, I drove through Scotland nice and easy, went through England. Um, where did I stay? Must have stayed overnight somewhere on the route down and then decided to take the channel across from England to France. There's a tunnel that goes under the, the channel and um, you can't drive on it, but you put your car on a train and then the train whizzes through the tunnel and deposits you out on the other side. Excuse me. So, got to the channel and uh, first of all, you had to pick a fare and um, I remember there was the fare was something like uh, twelve pound, which seemed awfully expensive in those days. And I was trying to save every penny I could for Africa. So the um, fare was twelve pound one way, but they had a special return fare for one pound. One pound for, but you had to return within twenty four hours. I thought, well, who's going to care if you return? Who's going to check if you return? What are they going to do if you don't return? So I bought a return fare for one pound for my Land Rover, and. Um, queue to go onto the ferry, onto the channel. I've never done this before. At, uh, and you queue in this big parking lot and there's uh, cars and then there's trucks and there's sort of, well, a sort of area for sort of mixed vehicles, which I suppose, because we weren't, Land Rover's not a truck, but it's not a car either. So we're sort of with the vans, I guess. And they come around and they ask various questions and you fill in, do you have anything dangerous on board and such like? And I said, no. Um, Okay, fine, then we queued, and then we come to boarding onto the train, and they're signaling the cars, and as we're rolling forward, somebody 
one of the officials stops and says, excuse me, excuse me, is that a gas bottle you've got in the back of there? And yeah, I've got a camping gas bottle tucked in the back of the Land Rover. And he said, oh, that's regarded as dangerous goods. You can't go in the, the normal thing. You have to go in a special carriage. And I go, okay. So I got sidelined off and got put in a, a separate carriage on the train. And uh, was it only vehicle in there? It's really weird. You could sort of go in and, and it's just like a big hollow area. You just drive in there. They fasten down the uh, thing, you put your handbrake on. And I was the only vehicle in that compartment. And I thought, okay, this is fine. No problems there. And uh, I'll, you get out of the vehicle and you sort of stand there and there's nothing else there. Nobody, there's no windows, of course. You're going to go through a, a, a channel, a tunnel under the sea. So I thought, well, okay, let's... Um, Let's just organise a few things in the back. I hadn't quite got things sorted and uh, shoved a few bits of shopping in. I'd done some shopping for food and things. Needed to put it in boxes. So open up the Land Rover, pull out a few boxes, pull out the shopping, scatter it all over the floor as the, as the train charges under the sea going heading to France on the, the start of my journey. And um, I sort of get all these things out and I'm sort of organising them. And suddenly there's an announcement we're approaching the station please get ready to disembark now, disembark I, I feel like we've hardly even been going i mean it only takes 30 or something minutes on there and i had all my stuff from the land rover scattered out over the thing oh my goodness i am stuffing things in the boxes shoving the boxes back into the um into the Land Rover, closing it up, making sure everything's secure, getting in the vehicle just in time for the, the side door to open and, and you roll down the ramp. I was even more of a mess when I rolled off the ferry, off the channel in France than I was when I got on the thing. I should have just left it. Anyway, rolled into France and it was night time or late evening. I'd missed the sunset. It, um, and uh, rolled out down the ramp and uh, follow the signs, of course everything's now in French, at, um, looking for the exit, and you go to the exit and find the highway and I want to head south, but obviously it's dark. And um, because fuel on the continent is cheaper than fuel is in the UK, I also needed, I didn't have a full tank of fuel. I wanted to save money, of course, and fill up mostly fuel with uh, in France before I went the long journey through the French countryside. Um, so I had diesel, it's a diesel, fuel in the tank, but not a full tank. So I didn't have an enormous range, like I couldn't drive more than about 200 miles or kilometers. Um, so I had to take a look out for fuel and I had to find somewhere to stay for the night. So um, came out onto the main road in France and then like I was like, where am I? <laughs> I didn't even have a map of France. <laughs> This is how prepared I was. I had maps of Africa, but no maps of France. And I thought, you know, it's like, I could just head south. I didn't really have a plan. It was November, cold, wet. I wasn't really intending to spend much time in, in Europe. I was getting to Africa was my main drive. Um, so I just looked for road signs for Paris. Paris is south. Drove south. But um, obviously I needed fuel. And um, if I was going to drive, because I was quite hyped up, I was ready to drive through the night a little bit, but I needed fuel first. So I trundled a little hundred kilometers or so south, and then I started looking for fuel, fuel station, pulled off. And uh, by this time it was rare, fairly late at night, and uh, the fuel station was operating, but closed. So it wasn't manned, it was an automated one, and only took credit cards, and didn't take my credit card. So I couldn't buy fuel. So I'm like, okay, and I can't really go much further. Um, I'll just have to park up somewhere and sleep for the night. So I drove around the back of the petrol station, found a quiet corner, reclined the seat as far back as it would go, and pulled a blanket over me, got some, put some warm clothes on because it was quite cold. And uh, the first night of my epic journey, was napping in a fairly uncomfortable to sleep in seat behind a petrol station, waiting for it to open in the morning. Hmm. Not the best way to start my journey. And the next morning I woke up quite grumpy, hungry, cold, and uh, stiff. I stretched my legs, waited for the petrol station to open, worked out 
how to get fuel in France tanked up and that tanked up oh boy and that uh, did take some doing because um, with the I've got an extra external um, fuel tank additional fuel tank installed on the Land Rover which I had installed in the UK uh, meant that I could take 120 litres of fuel in the main tanks so it uh, took quite a bit of filling up and, uh, and quite a bit of paying too but, uh, but that would hopefully see me right through the continent, that range. So filled up, went into the little shop, bought some snacks for breakfast. I'd also got some snacks the day before. Had my breakfast and then drove through France. And France is a big country. I didn't stop and see anything. I wasn't interested in France, really. Sorry, France. I'll come back one day and see you. Um, I, I, it's a big country. A big, big country. And I drove, and I drove, and I drove. And I was avoiding the tollways. You're going to want to save money. So I was trying to take more of the sort of back roads. So it meant I was going through towns and villages, which are obviously slower. But in a Land Rover, that's not a big problem. But um, uh, trundle, 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 trundle south. Um, sorting out all the rattles and packing everything. Stopping for some snacks on the way beside the road and uh, until it got dark again and then uh, I had actually earmarked a campsite that I was going to stop at near the south of France towards the Spanish border going down that way. But, um, my aim was to aim to go to the coast of Spain and get a ferry across from Spain to Morocco that's the plan. So headed to this campsite that I had earmarked and planned to go to. Go to. And uh, I turn up at about half past six on a November evening. It was already dark. There were some lights on though in the uh, thing and I drove up to the uh, the entrance gate, barrier across the gate. And uh, um, sort of peer out into the darkness and there's a, a, a woman in the uh, little thing and she's like going like this. I think she's waving so I wave back and I get out. And, um, and I think, camping, camping. And uh, she said, no, no, ferme, ferme basically closed and I went oh closed for the night but you know it's like can I come in no 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 oh. it uh I was like oh and then I actually looked up it was a seasonal campsite and it closed for the season it actually had closed that day had it been one day earlier I could have got it but that was, the previous day was the last day of the season it was then closed for the winter season I went, oh no I don't really want to spend another day sleeping in the Land Rover seat, especially after a long day of driving. Uh, two days in a row, I was like, no, this isn't happening. So I backed back a little bit and parked on the road outside, waited till she closed up the office. All the lights went out, so I get in her car and drive off. And then this is one of the benefits of having a Land Rover. I then drove round the barrier on the grass and drove into the campsite, tucked myself around a corner, <laughs> absolutely nothing there nobody there nothing there no lights and it was bitterly cold and uh, found a quiet corner made as little light as possible put on a small light got out on my little gas stove heated some water to make some pasta and it took ages to heat it was so cold I was like oh my goodness this is not going to be a good way to cook why can't I make a fire and I had the gas stove on those huddling around it trying to keep my fingers warm made some pasta put in some cup of soup to make a sauce ate that but then I put the tent out. My little, I've got a little tent that uh, I took for such emergencies. Put the tent out, went in there, and uh, also I didn't take a sleeping bag. I took a duvet because one of the important things of travel or anything is to get a good night's sleep. So I put my tent out, put my inflatable mat, these self-inflating mattresses. Really good investment that was. And then uh, got my sheet, took my sheet around it, got my duvet, put my duvet. Pillow, this is the advantage of travelling with a big Land Rover. You can pack lots of this unnecessary, but necessary stuff. Tucked under my duvet and had a good night's sleep. But I had to make sure I was up nice and early in case somebody came and caught me illegally camping in the campsite that was closed. Not exactly sure what they do, maybe charge me. Anyway, um, so that my second night was a lot more comfortable than my first night, but still cold. Got up in the morning, didn't even bother trying to boil water and everything. It was freezing packed everything up shoved it in the back of the landy 
and uh, hopped out of the campsite around the barrier before any irate French people came and chased me away with pitchforks. And then it was further south, heading south. They had to get warmer as they got south. This became the mantra, even from day two of traveling on this journey, that it's gonna get warmer if I go further south. That's right, hey? I don't know. To closer towards the equator. So, hopped in uh, the Land Rover and headed south. Now, for you who don't know, the European Union, excluding the UK now, has no borders. So, when you drove, drive from France to Spain, there's no big announcement, there's no queues at the border, there's no border, you just drive, woof, just drive the road. So, one minute I was in France, looking at the French countryside, and the next minute I noticed, hey, the language has changed. I was in Spain. Welcome to Spain. And again, I had earmarked a campsite. And again, I didn't go and see anything major in Spain. Again, sorry, Spain. I was on my way to Africa. You were just a transit. Another day, another time. Um, drove as far south through Spain as I could to another campsite that thankfully was open. And it was a little bit warmer. I believe it was San Sebastian. So I then... Uh, got to this lovely campsite and there was actually other people there as well not many other people but a few other people and um, and I arrived in the daylight two novel factors so I took the opportunity to test out a few other things I'd have got a side awning on the tent and uh, pull out my camping chairs and my table set a fire cook a decent meal it was still quite cool but it was quite a nice experience and I had a blanket. <laughs> I remember sitting on my camping chair, hot mug, a travel mug with some uh, coffee in it, sitting out. And this was a quite beautiful campsite. It was a really lovely campsite. And uh, sat there and said, ah, yeah, now the journey has really begun. At, uh, and tomorrow's task is to get to the coast, find a way to get away from Europe and Spain and cross to Africa. So I had a very comfy night that night. Again, I put the tent out because it was a little bit damp, but I put the tent under the awning beside the Land Rover, rolled out my inflatable bed, pulled out my duvet, my pillow, my sheet, and made a nice cozy bed. And that was me for the night. Night three of my journey. <clears throat> Up early the next morning, time to sort a few things out, pack everything away, and then head down to the coast. Now, unfortunately, picking a very good time of year to travel through Europe, not, uh, the weather had turned and it was really windy. So I headed down to the coast to this port where I'd planned to, to where it's the easiest crossing, um, the closest crossing to get to Morocco from Spain. And I got to the port at, uh, after, oh, where was it? after traveling through Valencia. First of all, I went through Valencia. I'll never forget Valencia. Big Land Rover traveling through Valencia with the crazy Spanish traffic. Oh my goodness. And, and of course, the Land Rover is a right-hand drive. Europe is left-hand drive. So I was driving on the unfamiliar side of the road with the steering wheel on the wrong side, which caused a lot of consternation between me and the other road users. Fortunately, being a Land Rover and a bit bigger than most of the other road users, most people would give away to my you know, lane drifting as I sort of like worked out where to go and tried to read the signs and trying to find my way through Valencia to the port. At, um, except there was one very, very unfortunate hitch. A lot of Valencia, um, the road is built that goes un like like underpasses under other roads and, and under buildings and tunnels like that. And uh, as I was going, I saw you know the the sign for the port that I was heading for, and I took one of these slip roads off, and it went down, and I didn't notice that there was a war a height restriction warning. But I'd already committed, and I was down the lane, and then of course I came to it, and then there was a big. <laughs> low thing and I'm thinking I'm not sure if my Land Rover will fit under that because it's a high vehicle anyway and I put raised suspension on it with the, with the uh, off-road suspension and I had a roof rack and I had stuff fuel cans and things on the roof rack sticking up and I looked at the height on that and I thought I'm too tall to get under there <laughs> so I went down this one-way ramp got there and then I thought I, have, I can't do this 
So, much to the annoyance, and I do apologise to a large portion of the commuter traffic in Valencia of that time, I actually stopped in the lane. Thankfully, there was room to pass, pulled across, and had to get out and check that the Land Rover would fit underneath. Guess what? It wasn't going to go. <laughs> and there was no available to turn around, and it was busy, and I had to reverse up this slip road into the traffic to get back to the main road. That <laughs> Thankfully, British plates, Land Rover, GB sticker on the back, all the French people just, oh, sorry, Spanish people, just waved their hands, leant on their horns and swerved around me and said rude things about British drivers in Spain. And in this case, they would be quite right. Fortunately, it was quite a short <laughs> reverse up. We, we survived. I survived. I'm not sure about the Spanish drivers. Anyway, we got back up, got back on the road and continued to stick to the normal non-under route roads through the rest of Valencia. I was very happy to get outside the other Valencia and see that city behind me and, and that, that, that city always gives me nightmares when I think of driving <laughs> Land Rover through it. But made it safely through. Got to the port and um, went to inquire about getting a ticket on the ferry and they went sorry the ferries are cancelled today the the wind is too high we're not going to get across um, but maybe if you go a little bit further down the coast because where I was planning was the the hydrofoils and they're very sensitive to the weather but it's a longer journey across as well and they said if you maybe go a little further down the coast to the next port town uh, the next major port they're the bigger ferries, they might still be running, uh, even in this weather, if you want to go today. And I really didn't want to spend any more time in cold Europe, or especially near Valencia. Anyway, so back in the Land Rover, drive down the coast, and arrived at the next port, port city of, ooh, I'll put its name up here for you. And uh, it was getting later in the day now, went in there, and their ferries were running, but there was no more ferries that day. So I had to uh, to wait. And I'd already got into the port. And I thought, what can I do? It is like, and it's late and I have no idea where to go and it's quite cold. So I pulled in amongst the trucks that were all queuing for the ferry as well, waiting for the next day's ferry and uh, camped at the port. One of the least conducive places for um, camping, especially at night in those times, because what I didn't realise is that all the people had parked their trucks, locked them up and gone to a nearby hotel. So there was actually nobody there. So I parked my Land Rover amongst the trucks, got out, made myself uh, some food on the gas stove, put my tent out, put my bed out, got in there for the night. Now I hadn't quite got to sleep when there's this... Um, shaking of the tent and I thought oh no this is you know gonna be some port official saying you can't camp here well obviously in Spanish <laughs> so, you can't not camp here I don't do a Spanish accent well do I anyway so I thought it was gonna be somebody gonna chase me when saying Look, you can't camp here for the night go to a room or something and I, I had so much stuff in the Land Rover I didn't want to leave it and all my camera quit oh no anyway um so I'm sleepy eyed and I, and I pulled a t-shirt on and unzip the tent and you expect to see a port official. Instead, I'm confronted with this man with a knife, waving a knife around and going like this. Uh, oh, my goodness, I haven't even got to Africa and somebody is trying to rob me. And I, was, I was unhappy. Let's put it that way. It, uh, fortunately for me, and not so fortunately for him, uh, he... he he, he was either drunk or high on drugs or something like that. And a firm shove, stroke, push, persuaded him that he wasn't going to get anything. And, um, you know, flailing of arms on both sides. And uh, he basically strode off into the night. But it didn't leave me with a comfortable feeling, thinking there's a guy with a knife wandering around out there. So I did sleep there for the night. But I didn't feel overly comfortable, I've got to admit. It uh, huddled in my tent, just, you know, sort of like keeping an ear out for, you know, some dude with a knife to come and maybe break into the car or 
or try and break into the tender. I don't know. Anyway, I was quite glad when morning came. First light, I was up, packing everything away, into the Land Rover, and ready to go. Had to wait a few hours for the port to open, the offices, wander in, look for a ticket, buy a ticket, get a ticket for the first ferry across, and uh, I am ready to arrive in Africa. But the weather didn't cooperate. So the time for the ferry came and they came round and uh, they made some announcement in Spanish which I didn't hear and, uh, and I didn't understand. If I had heard, I wouldn't understand. And um, then suddenly everybody's just locking up and going away and I'm sort of like, um, uh, hello? Hello, uh, hello, hola, hello, what's going on? <laughs> Eventually went and found something that that ferry has been cancelled, the weather's bad again, that ferry is not running, um, they will try at one o'clock. So I sort of like, oh dear. So I remember driving into the nearby town, trying to find somewhere for breakfast, somewhere where I could park the Land Rover, keep an eye on it and get breakfast. Drove into town, found a little um, cafe, had some breakfast, and uh, wild away a few hours before going back to the port, waiting for the one o'clock ferry. One o'clock came and went, and guess what? It still didn't go. It was like I was not going to get to Africa at this rate. Oh, no. And then they said, no, the weather is getting worse. Um, there will, this ferry has been cancelled. There's no more ferries for the day, and uh, you can either keep your ticket or get a refund. So. Uh, oh, what do I do? And then uh, somebody said, well, if you go further down the coast, there's uh, where it's because where it's shorter across the sea by the Straits of Gibraltar. There's a ferry service that goes from there across to Morocco that's much shorter and has bigger ferries. So that might be running. Uh, OK, let me get a refund on this ticket. Got my money back and drove further down the Spanish coast to where it narrows down between that little gap across the Straits of Gibraltar between Africa and Europe and got there by this time it was quite late in the evening so I was like pushing it a little bit all afternoon I was pushing it a little bit to see if there's another ferry and when I got there there was a ferry and it was going and it was just loading as I arrived so I scrambled to get a ticket and raced down and I was the second last vehicle onto the ferry so I was so relieved I was on my way to Africa and it's quite a shortish journey across that part the weather was quite rough but I still went up on the deck beautiful views you go past Gibraltar that's right in the middle of the uh, the gap between the Atlantic Sea and the Mediterranean between Africa and Europe it's uh, quite an amazing place and beautiful views cross the Straits of Gibraltar and finally arrived in Spain no, I had had no way around. But what I didn't know at this point was that there's actually a little enclave that still belongs to Spain that's tucked on the northern part of Africa, right in Morocco. So I still hadn't actually got left Spain yet. And you get off the ferry. Uh, one of the advantages of that is you've got duty-free fuel in this enclave. So I went and tanked up the Land Rover, filled up my big tanks, and then, and only then, I was able to leave Europe. So I trundled down to the customs and excise and the departure, had all my paperwork ready. Now this was the first time since leaving Scotland that I'd had to show a passport or paperwork for the vehicle I'd driven from Scotland through England, under the channel, through France and Spain, and across the European Union. At that time, no borders, drove all the way through. So this was the first time I was actually in Africa and I'd never shown anybody my passport or my car paperwork. So I, was, I got, all, got all my paperwork ready and sorted, drive up to the uh, border and it's just coming up to sunset and um, the mullah calls from the local mosque and uh, all the officials just put down their stamps, put in the paperwork, close the thing and say, no, no, and go. And I'm like, but come on, I was like, am I not going to get into Africa? What is happening? Well, I turned up during Ramadan and of course during Ramadan, they can't eat during the day, so when the sunset comes and the bullock calls, they go to prayers and they go to eat. So I had to wait another hour just sitting there at the border. I'm not in Spain, I'm not in Morocco, I'm nowhere. Just sit and wait 
for the officials to come back after prayers and eating. <laughs> then it was a fairly simple, straightforward stamp in my passport, my first African stamp on this passport, first stamp in the carnet for Lara the Land Rover, and I could roll into the night into Morocco.